the lovely Michael Benier. And um, I'm sure that you guys know him from his work in Reboot. And our all the uh, great masterpiece of Canadian television. So um, basically I'm going to open it up to Michael right now. He has some, some things to say and um, then we'll let you guys ask some questions. Thanks. I come from LA <laughs> <laughs> through agents, casting directors, and recording sessions to this place. <laughs> the Calgary Comic and Entertainment Expo in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. <laughs> My format, actor. <laughs> to act and attend panel discussions from longtime fans, to answer their questions and requests, and to autograph 8 by 10s <laughs> They say the users live outside the net. No one knew for sure, but today, here they are. The fans <laughs> of Reboot. I just have to say, first off, that I've never done a convention before. Some of you may know that I did one a couple years ago via Skype in Vancouver. But this is the first time that I've ever uh, come face to face with fans of Reboot. And I have to say, if I choke up, I'm really overwhelmed by this. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I did this show uh, you know, years ago in Vancouver when I was about 23, and I had been doing other cartoons. And uh, they said they're going to do this new CGI show, and uh, I knew the casting people. I'd worked with them and helped cast. And uh, one afternoon, I went into the office, and they had the promo reel of what they had hoped to do for Reboot. And there was a voice on the reel, and uh, kind of narrating it as the character of Bob. And I walked in, and I said, is that me? <laughs> and it sounded so much like me that I was like, I don't remember recording this. He goes, it does sound like you, which was Doug Parker, who was the casting director. And I think at that moment, it kind of lodged in his head that I should be the voice of Bob. So uh, I auditioned, like many other things, and I was called back, and I got it. And uh, it took a long, long time from the first session to actually having the show air, because it was such revolutionary technology. So it was over a year or a year and a half. And I believe even before it aired, I had gone to Los Angeles uh, on a vacation trip, and I was cast through circumstances in the... Uh, the remake of the Johnny Quest show is the voice of Haji. So, um, which is what prompted me kind of to move uh, full-time or part-time to LA at that time. So before we even get to that, many people ask me, why did you leave Reboot? And, and I didn't leave Reboot. I continued to record the show uh, in uh, Vancouver. I would fly myself up by my, on my own dime and to do the show. But it took so long to do the show and they wouldn't give me a long-term contract, which I had with Johnny Quest, which was the reason that I lived in Los Angeles. But I continued to do the show uh, all the way through the second season, and uh, I, I didn't even know that they had done a third season until someone told me that I had been replaced. So um, it's, it's, it's okay. It's okay. It all worked out in the end. It all worked out in the end. It all worked out in the end. But uh, I just wanted to put that on the table so we, we deal with that first. So I had no hard feelings for them at all, and here we are today, almost 20 years later after doing the show, and it's, it's really touching. Thank you. up to questions and just answer questions. Okay? Do we'll do that? I agree. Or if you have any yeah. for me. Um, I can start off with questions okay. and then I'll throw it to you guys. Um, because it was such like a Canadian masterpiece and that it had all this brand new technology and yes. things like that, um, what has been like your experience with like computers and things like that and like what you were saying and dealing with? Like did you get like, like are you like big into computers and so got the little like subtleties of it okay. or? Uh, well, yeah, I am a Mac user. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I have to be honest with you. Oh, yeah. Mac users over there, PCs over here. Um, it was really, a lot of it was over my head and still is over my head and I did learn a lot about it doing the show. So there was that, but you know, I did the first two seasons, which were more, and then subsequent the fourth season. But I did them; they were more kind of self-contained, almost sitcomish, I would say. <coughs> yeah, sitcomish. So I was more a, a, attracted to kind of the sitcom aspect of it and the, the humor of it, you know. So uh, I didn't look at kind of the deeper and subtexts of the of the, the computer stuff. That was for the fans out there. Who got that stuff. Mm -hmm. 
All right, and so I'll open it up to you guys. Uh, if you have any questions, just raise your hand. Yes. Is there a certain line from the show, let's say, when you're doing recording for an episode that you remember, like something that sticks out in your mind for you when you think of your time doing the show? Okay, funny question. The question was, is there a certain line on Reboot that uh, sticks out in my mind? Uh, when we did the pilot episode, I believe, tell me if I'm wrong, I'm sure you guys know more than I do. Uh, I believe it was the, the Racing the Clock was the first one we recorded, and there was a, there was a line which was, I don't think so. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you guys remember this, but there was a rap song in the late 80s by LL Cool J called Going Back to Cali. Does anybody know it? What? Okay. So uh, there's a line in the song, a refrain he says several times. He says, I'm going back to Cali, I'm going back to Cali. And then he pauses and he says, uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. So when I got the script, I thought that it was a reference or a nod to LL Cool J. And uh, I did the, the line kind of as uh, Bob, kind of, you know, giving an homage to LL Cool J. Small world, full circle. I live in Los Angeles most of the time now, and I do acting. And uh, I went to an event, and LL Cool J was there. <laughs> and I went up to him, and I said, I just have to tell you this. And I told him this, this story, and he looked at me, and he said, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so props to LL on that one. <laughs> Uh, the other funny thing is, is that when I did the, uh, the, the Skype thing a couple years ago, uh, someone asked me to do the opening of the show, which everybody knows was on every episode. I recorded that one time in 1994. Yeah. So I didn't really know the show, uh, the opening title. I knew the first line, I come from the net. And uh, it's kind of funny because you know how people don't like to hear them, their, their voice recorded or see themselves on, 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 uh, on film or TV? You know, when the show would start, and by the way, I was living in Los Angeles pretty much from the beginning of the airing of the show. So even though it was very popular in Canada, it only aired on Saturday mornings in the States. So when I would come to Canada, I realized it was airing three times a day on YTV. <laughs> and so uh, every time it would start, I would, you know, I would put on the TV and I come from the net. And I would be like, oh, I can't hear this. So I, I know the first line. I know the first line. And it was very funny because, like I said, today, you know, so many people have come up to me. People drove from Saskatchewan for eight hours, and, you know, and they've told me they grew up with the show. And it's just things I could never, ever imagine uh, doing this 20 years ago. And uh, the funny thing is, is that you all know who I am looking at me now, knowing I do the voice. But when I did this, no one knew. So these are some anecdotes. Uh, when I would come back to Canada to record the show in the first two years, I would go through customs and they say, what are you doing here? I'm an actor. And they go, what, what are you working on? I say, I'm doing a show called Reboot. You're on Reboot. Who, 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 are, who are you on Reboot? I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm Bob. You're Bob on Reboot? And then he's like, hey, Dave, this is Bob on Reboot. And, all that thing. and uh, it, it was very, very touching, very nice. And I, I've, I've told some of these anecdotes and I'll tell them again, which was I was flying across country at one point, across Canada. And there was a woman there with her two kids. They must have been about eight or nine. And they were playing with a Bob action figure. And I said, you know, I was a little proud of myself. I said, you know, that's me. And she goes, oh, really? What? I was like, well, I'm Bob. She goes, oh, like in a mall? And I was like, what? And she's like, oh, like, I thought she meant like, you know, one of those like, you know, uh, they, things they do in a mall, you know? I was like, no, no, that, I did the voice. Oh, really? She goes, well, I have to get you to sign something. And she gave me a barf bag to sign. <laughs> Somewhere out there, someone is holding a bar bag with my signature. <laughs> um, a year, another, another one, which was really funny, was I do, I do on-camera acting in, in movies and TV. And uh, I did a movie, must have been 96, 97. It was a movie with uh, Joe Mantegna and Dennis Leary called Underworld. It didn't really do anything. I saw it. OK, all right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So you've seen me and that get killed, shot in the back of the head. And uh, we're in this limousine for, I would say, five or six days. And they have different versions of the limousine where we, we get out of half of it so that we can do one side. It's like, you know, a lot goes into this. So I'm sitting with Joe Mantegna, who everybody knows from The Godfather and everything. And, and he's like, we're talking. And he goes, so uh, what do you do? I said, I'm actually in town doing this cartoon. And he goes, uh, what are you doing? And I said, I do this show, Reboot. He goes, what do you do on Reboot? <laughs> and I said, do you, do you know Reboot? He goes, yeah. <laughs> so he goes, what do you do on Reboot? And I said, uh, I play the character Bob. Yo, Bob. <laughs> and 
I was like, how does Joe Mantegna know about Reboot? And, and he tells me this very touching story. He said, um, he says, I have a daughter. She's about eight years old. She's autistic. And he said that uh, she would kept saying Reboot, Reboot, Reboot. And uh, one morning he woke up. Uh, early on Saturday morning, he came down and she pointed to the screen, which was Reboot. And she responded to the, the design of the show, the, the CGI of the show. And he says, wait till I tell my wife I met Bob from Reboot. <laughs> so um, they were here, and I tried to arrange for them to get a tour of the facility, but I think I just had some toys sent to him and his wife. But that was good when Bob from Reboot Pet was known by Joe Mantegna. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Mm. Is there questions? I was kind of wondering um, if you did know who the person you um, there, there are a couple of movies and they ended really abruptly and people have been trying to bring back the series. What are your opinions on that? Uh, I will say uh, categorically I am 100% in favor of bringing back Reboot. <laughs> uh, on the other end of that, I have nothing to do with bringing back Reboot. <laughs> But um, I know that they tried a couple years ago with a thing online called Zeros to Heroes. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know what happened from that, if anything. Um, I don't really know who owns the rights. I know for many years it was a thing where uh, Alliance Atlantis had it originally, and then Mainframe had it, and then Mainframe became Rainmaker, and, and a variety of things. And then um, Mainframe mostly is a service provider now as an animator. They do it's a lot of stuff from Mattel. They do, um, Barbie and things like that. And I did voices on a thing called Hot Wheels World Race, which they did. And, um, you know, I think that if enough people make, you know, a noise about it, maybe they'll bring it back. But I don't know who to write to. I don't know, your congressman? I, I don't know. <laughs> Stephen Harper? I, I, I don't know. But um, I would love it to come back, and I hope all of you would too. Yes? Do you think it would kind of take away from the show with how good technology is now to how we remember Reboot being so new for its time, ahead of its time? Do you think it would take away from what Reboot was to bring it back and do it now with our technology? The question is, do I think it would take away from the original look of the show and how it would look today? Yeah. You know, it's interesting because when I, I went to do the, the movies in 2000, which was the My Two Bobs and all that, um, and when I saw it, I felt it looked, I don't know, it, it didn't look the same, right? It looked, it looked different. And I think that that was supposed to be new and improved, right? Almost better. Um, I think that the idea for Reboot in the first place was that they, they had this technology which looked kind of crude and primitive. These are the guys that did, you know, Gavin and Phil and Ian, who had done um, the, the Dire Straits Money, Money for Nothing video. So they were like, why don't we do a show that takes place in a computer so that there's no question about why it looks so weird? Right, so so that you know in '95, '96, that was you know Reboot was cutting edge technology, right? And I think that that look fits the world inside a computer, in my opinion. So when I saw the the version in 2000, and, and you know when Bob was animated and the, the the two Bobs and all that, it reminded me. This is just my taste personally of when Toy Story. You're watching the toys and they look like toys. And then you see a person, you're like, it doesn't really look like a person, it doesn't look like a toy, it's kind of not, not this, not that. So I think if they were to do it, they should do it kind of more of the classic style, in my opinion, of, of the show. But that's just my opinion, so I don't know. Another question? There's one in the back, yeah. Yes. Um, I was like, you had a great voice acting cast. Did you ever get to work with any of the other voice actors in the show, like, uh, actually record with them? Right. The question was uh, that if I had a chance to record with other voice actors in the cast. Uh, yes, when we did Reboot in Vancouver when I was there, we did it very much like a radio play, all that stuff. And it was a lot of fun. And a lot of the actors I'd known for years before, we'd done other cartoons together. Uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, uh, you know, um, Kathleen Barr, who was, was uh, Dot, um, uh, Phil uh, Hayes, uh, Gary Chalker, or Hack and Slash. Uh, I'm just trying to throw out characters and I'll tell you who they were. I don't know, uh, Shirley. Mike the TV. Mike the TV. Mike the TV. Interesting question is um, Mike Donovan, who played Mike the TV and Cecil or Cecil, um, was an actor. And then when Andre Romano, the original director, left, he ended up directing the show. So he is a very sought after director as well as actor right now. Um, a lot of people ask me about Tony J. And Tony never recorded in uh, Vancouver with the cast, he did it by himself in Los Angeles. And when I moved there, um, 
we had the same agent. So I would see him in, in uh, the waiting room of this agency, ICM, in the mornings. And one day I introduced myself. I said, my name is Michael Banyer. I do the voice of Bob. And he's like, oh, really? And, and he really sounded like that. He was a British actor, Shakespearean <laughs> trained, who was about 6'5". And he was probably in his 50s or early 60s at the time. And then when they realized that it would be OK for me to go on the recording sessions that he did in Los Angeles, so he would do his lines. He would sit down in the studio with a cigarette um, and record his lines three in a row. He would just do three versions of his line by himself. He'd say, I haven't felt this good since my first infection. I haven't felt this good since my first infection. I haven't felt this good since my first infection. And then he'd take a drag of his cigarette and leave. So <laughs> I watched him do this. And, and I went in there. We, we did it. And I did some sessions by myself. I did. I'd say I, the, pretty much the remainder of the, the second season by myself uh, in LA. So I would be done in about a half an hour. So I would get the script, and one of them vividly, which was Bad Ball, which was pretty much me yelling in a studio on Melrose Avenue by myself <laughs> for half an hour. And I, I, I had no idea. I mean, he had the script. He's like, and you know, and the, the, the producer, Chris Bruff, who talked like this, he was kind of a New York kind of guy, talked like this. He's like, Okay, now you're on the you're you're hanging off of the the truck now. Okay, you're like y'all like you're gonna die, you know. So <laughs> so that was a lot a lot of that a lot of that. Um, I don't know. I mean, he was a very nice guy, and I was very sad to hear his passing. So hopefully, if they do reboot again, they would get someone who could sound somewhat like him. Yeah. Other questions? Anybody? In the back. Yes, yes, in the back. Um, I was actually wondering, did you go to university or did you just start out acting? Thank you. Let's let's get some education props in here. The question was, <laughs> did I go to university, as they say in Canada? Um, yes. I uh, I've been acting since I was in high school, and uh, I did my first cartoon. Actually, was a, a cartoon. I got some notoriety in Canada because I was cast as the voice of Ken for Barbie and Ken, Barbie and the Rockers. <laughs> I was about seventeen, and uh, it was very uh, notable because they they thought it was very funny that an all Canadian was doing the all American. <laughs> And uh, I remember this was in the news. I was in the claims, and I was on midday at the time. And uh, it was very funny because they were—they were the Americans were very nervous that we would sound too Canadian doing, <laughs> doing these things. And I and I remember I was in the studio and I had a line or two. Was like, you know, I don't know about you. And they're like, you're saying a boot. You're saying a boot. And I said, what? I'm not talking about a boot. You're like, no, you're pronouncing about a boot. So I was very conscious to sound American. And I was doing cartoons, and I continued to act in high school in college and then I wrote for a television series with two friends when I was about 18 for CBC called Pilot One. That was canceled because of a CBC strike, which these things still go on in Canada, I'm sorry. And uh, after that I was like, screw this show business, I'm going to school. So I went to uh, UBC and I got a degree in creative writing and I continued to act and I wanted to go to Los Angeles and while I was in UBC, I was doing cartoons. I was doing a show called Exo Squad. I was doing a show called The Hurricanes, where I played a couple characters. And then I got the show Reboot. And like I said, it went long. And then I was in Los Angeles on vacation for a week. And my first day there, this, we went for dinner with this woman to pitch a TV show. And she looked at me and said, you're an actor and you do voiceovers? I said, yes. She says, uh, there's a famous cartoon company. They need, do you do a Middle Eastern accent? And I was like, yes. I was in LA for five hours of being typecast already. I was like, yes. <laughs> and so I found out that the show was Johnny Quest and that he was not Middle Eastern, he was East Indian. And, uh, and she said, same thing. And I was like, OK, welcome to Hollywood. I was like, OK. <laughs> and I said, uh, she goes, can you do that? I said, yes, I can do an East Indian accent. I said, but I know the show from the 60s, and he's seven years old. I said, I'm good, but I'm not that good. I, I, I can't sound seven. She goes, no, he's 17 now. I said, that I could do. <laughs> so um, that job got me into Los Angeles, and I did that. and continued to fly back and forth to, to do shows in Canada. And once again, I was very dismayed by the lack of movement in my acting career. I wanted to do more on camera, even though I love voiceover. And um, I got into grad school in uh, uh, Los Angeles for film producing at UCLA. I did that for two years while I continued to act. That ended. I'm sorry, I'm telling you all my, my life story here, but I just want you to know that you can be an actor as well as go to school, young people here. And um, I thought about it, and I'm turning 30, and I was like, what am I doing? I need to get a real, real job, real degree. So I went and applied to law school. 
And I got into law school in Manitoba. Anybody yeah. from Manitoba here? All right. Uh, and the summer before uh, I went to law school, they called me up out of the blue and they said, uh, Reboot is doing more movies and they want you back. And I started laughing on the phone. I said, but I was fired. And they said, no, you're going to be back, as is Ian Corlett. And I was like, what? And uh, I was like, that's fine. So we did both. And I did those the summer before I went to law school in 2001. And when I get to Winnipeg, uh, my first week of school, they call me and they say, we want to change the opening for the final season, the last four movies of, of, of Reboot. And they said, we'd like you to record a new opening, the new the monologue. And I said, well, that's very nice, but I'm in law school now. <laughs> and they said, but we'll record you wherever you are. So just so you know, the first, the opening monologue of the final season was recorded in the CBC in downtown Winnipeg <laughs> before my criminal law class. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Uh, yeah. I did finish law school, and in my last year of law school, I was in Hollywood, LA, for uh, a week of what's called pilot season to do uh, auditions for pilots for TV shows. I got a pilot. Uh, I did an episode of a TV show called The Shield, and and I realized that my true calling, my true passion, was to be an actor. And I finished law school, I got my degree, and I went back to LA, where I've been pretty much full time for the last eight or nine years. So I continue to work in LA and Canada when they call me, and here we are today. And this is really the most touching thing I could ever imagine. I would have never imagined this. Thank you. Is that enough questions, or we could talk some more here? I think we yeah, can talk some more. Yeah, I haven't seen the uh, elusive five minute sign. So yeah, if there's any more questions. Okay. Are you still a Canadian citizen? I am still a Canadian citizen. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> And, that, and that's something that's really interesting because today I realized how much uh, Reboot is very, very Canadian. And it's very much a part of, uh, I think, everybody here who watched Reboot as a kid and grew up with it, it's very much part of their Canadian childhood. Much like for myself when I was a kid, there was a show called uh, Mr. Dress Up. <laughs> so, when, when people came up to me today and they said, I grew up with you, I grew up with this character, and I was like, it's pretty much like me meeting Casey or Finnegan. <laughs> um, except I'm talking, I'm not a mute dog. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's been great because, you know, uh, Reboot was done in Vancouver, and as you all know, on the show, they did a lot of uh, plays or puns on, uh, on places in Vancouver, the Kit Sector, or, which is Kitsilana, uh, Bodway, which was Broadway. Uh, and even, of course, they didn't like dealing with Los Angeles, and, you know, ABC, which was why they called it Lost Angles, right? All these things. So it, it was very good. Um, I, I, more questions, or I could just talk, you know, on, on tangents. Yes? Do you have a favorite reference? Do you have a favorite reference? Yeah, like, uh, is, is like that Los Angeles, Los Angeles? Um, Los Angeles, Los You know what's amazing is that a lot of people ask me when they design things to write uh, Stay Frosty. <laughs> and, uh, now this is funny because uh, when I got it in the script, in one of the scripts, it said "Stay Frosty." So I remember saying it, and I, I thought it was like trying to be like you know cool, like stay cool. So I said, "Stay Frosty," <laughs> like that. And uh, when they told me later, they said that when they originally envisioned, they'd written the scripts before I was officially cast. They envisioned Bob more of a Michael Bean type character from from Aliens. And they thought he was going to be a little more badass. <laughs> so they said that what happened was that when I was cast, they kind of liked the, uh, the kind of the fallible hero aspect of it, which was that a guy who was kind of in over his head. And I, in my mind, it was, it was kind of a combination vocally of, of Michael J. Fox, which was the voice would always crack, kind of like, I don't know what I'm doing, you know, kind of, kind of thing. And a kind of a Spider-Man, which was a young guy who was kind of thrust into it you know, great power, he didn't know how to, to, to deal with. So when I did the voice, I, I always didn't want him to be too cool, like to be a guy who was like really a hero. It was kind of a guy who was made a hero unwittingly, you know? So I think that Stay Frosty has really taken on a life of its own because everyone wants me to say it. And um, it's, I'm gonna beat you to it. What's my favorite episode? <laughs> um, 
My favorite episode, and I will say this, I've not seen any of season three, just so you know, okay? So uh, I, I, I can't say whether they're good or bad, I don't know. So, but I did, my favorite episode was one called uh, Wizards and Warriors. <laughs> That was when we were kind of finding our stride in the first, it was written by a friend of mine who was a writer on the show named John O'Howard. And I thought it was the best usage of the idea of a game within a game. Because, as an actor, because usually you go incoming game and then you're basically running and jumping and shooting. Whereas Dungeons and Dragons, which is kind of a role playing game, they had a, a video game version of this, I guess, right? And or, there was a game on, remember the original Coleco vision called Venture? Does anyone remember that? <laughs> okay, so it reminded me kind of of that, which is it was, you had to act as another character. Do you follow what I'm saying? It wasn't just running and shooting, so that it was Bob it was not Bob, he was now the thief, right? So that you had the star of the show, who was the hero, was now playing someone, you know, unlikable. You know, he looked unlikable, he was missing a tooth, he had, you know, stubble. And my favorite line, and, and people have said it to me, it's funny that it came through, was, uh, prepare to taste the wrath of my butter knife. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, there was a lot of stuff that we improvised in that. Yeah, I remember even Mike Donovan kind of improvised stuff, like as Mike the TV, um, that, like television references. Uh, I think, and I feel like I, who says it? I mean, you guys can tell me. Who said, who said, stay away from me, boy? Was that me? Or was that Mike the TV? That was Mike. That was Mike. Okay, well, I said to him, I said, it's kind of like W.C. Fields. He's like, oh, right. So it was very collaborative at the time. And, uh, you know, the, the thing is that um, when people ask me about my favorite jobs in my life, like as an actor, uh, I have favorite jobs for different reasons. I, I did a movie which allowed me to shoot in India. I did a movie that allowed me to shoot in Morocco, which were once in a lifetime experiences. Uh, Johnny Quest, which was an amazing experience because it got me into the United States as an actor, which I'd always wanted to do. And every week I would do the show and they would have famous actors playing guest roles. Um, remind, I'll, I'll tell this now. With my first day on the job of um, Johnny, Johnny Quest, I had to get there early to the studio Hanna-Barbera, which was the famed studio where they did the Flintstones and Scooby-Doo and all these things. And I was in the waiting room, I was there early, I didn't know how long it would take me to get there. And the director, uh, Chris Zimmerman, said to her assistant, make sure Mark Hamill has all the sides. Sides is the scripts of, uh, for, for an actor. And I said, I beg your pardon? <laughs> and she said, make sure Mark Hamill has all the sides. I said, Mark Hamill, as in Star Wars. <laughs> and she said, yes. I said, oh my god, I was so nervous. I was 24 years old. And she's like, well, what, what's the problem? I said, you, know, you don't understand. I, I, I'm 24 years old. I said, what, from the age of 7 to 13, every day of my life was obsessed with Star Wars. <laughs> and I said, and I, 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 I can't even believe he's here. She, he's here. She's like, well, that's no big deal. He has a smaller part than you. Do you know who Robert Patrick is? And I said, uh, yeah. He's going to work with you every week. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and she's like, you're not impressed? I'm like, no, he was famous after I was a kid. <laughs> so it wasn't that impressed. So uh, Mark Hamill is sitting next to me, doodling on his script. We do the record, we do the rehearsal, we do the episode, I go home. Now, I'm not gonna lie to you, I'm a fan of, of, of movies and things like this growing up. So I'm sitting on the way home in the car and I'm like, Michael, your whole life as a kid, from seven years old, you dreamed of what you would say to Luke Skywalker when you worked with, if you got to meet him, to work with him, you would prove that you are a, you are a true fan. You're an idiot. It's like that, that Chris Farley, <laughs> stupid, 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 you know? <laughs> so I said, if I ever see him again, I know what I'm going to say. He's there the next day. <laughs> <laughs> so we're sitting at the rehearsal thing, and he's doodling again, huh, no big deal, like he's like, no big deal. And there's about a two minute gap between the rehearsal session and the recording booth. This is 1996, 95. So I say this question that I've got ready, and I say it in a joking manner, like, so it doesn't make me look bad if it's stupid. I'm like, <laughs> hey, you know, Mark, I heard this rumor when I was a kid that uh, when you signed to do Star Wars, that you stipulated in your contract that you would get one piece of merchandise made with everything made with accordance with the film. Is that true? He's like, yes. 
<laughs> I said, really? It's true. He goes, yes. He goes, look, Michael, he says, when we signed to do the movie, we thought it would be a soundtrack and a book. We know, had no idea that it would be, you know, toothpaste and, you know, <laughs> records and you know, you know, sleeping bags. And I said, really? And I said, and I heard that you got so much stuff that you had to put it all in an airplane hanger? Yes. <laughs> I said, really? He goes, not an airplane hanger. He was like, you know, it's a storage space. There's so much stuff I couldn't keep it in my house. And I said, well, what do you do with all this stuff? And he says, well, I have kids. I gave them the action figures. And my daughter shaped Princess Leia's head, too. <laughs> and I was like, wow. And they were just about to do the, um, the movies, the, the new movies. And, we, and he was talking about that. So that was very exciting. So, you know, Johnny Quest. Los Angeles provided me the opportunity to meet all these actors that I admired. I, can, I mean, if you look at the list of the people who were on the George Siegel was with me every week, uh, Robert Patrick. Every episode I would have, there would be another guest, I don't know, Roddy McDowell from you know, Planet of the Apes. I, mean, I couldn't even believe it. I was pinching myself every week. So what's my favorite, you know, my favorite thing about Johnny Quest is he got me to the States. I worked at Hanna-Barbera. Frank Welker, who played the dog with me, was every character in a cartoon ever from 1970. <laughs> so, and this is before IMDb. So I got this book, which was called The Encyclopedia of Animation. I picked it up in a book, the bookstore in LA called Samuel French. And there wasn't even an index in it because it was so like new in this book. And I would go through shows and it was like Laugh Olympics. And I'd come back and I'd go, you were so-and-so in Laugh Olympics to Frank Welker? He's like, yep, yep. You know, and then he would do these dog sounds, which were amazing. and. Every week I would go back and realize he was somebody else from my childhood, which blew me away. And I love Johnny Quest for that. Reboot I love for one major reason, other than that being Canadian, I'm very proud of that, was that it was a show that allowed me to create the character. And like I said, originally it was supposed to be more of a classic hero type, and that they allowed me to infuse my sense of humor into it. I guess me talking right now, you can hear that and a lot of my vocal inflections and my uh, timings was put into the show. And uh, I was very pleased that they let it happen like that and they wrote to my voice later in the show. So I'm very proud of Reboot for allowing me to be a, um, a sitcom star, if you will, a Canadian sitcom <laughs> star in my mind. Um, it's funny, somebody said to me yesterday, uh, they go, you know, I love that show growing up. I never imagined Bob would look like you. <laughs> now, in my defense, when we started the show, I had very long hair. I did have long hair, and I had more of a blue tan. But <laughs> um, I don't look like the classic Bob anymore. Any more questions? Yes? Um, on Enzo's birthday, there's a guitar solo. Do The question was, on Enzo's birthday, there was a guitar solo. Between you and Megabyte. Between uh, Bob and Megabyte. <laughs> uh, um, uh, I am a voice actor. Um, I do not play guitar. Uh, I had nothing to do with the guitar playing of that episode. I'm sorry. Any other questions? Yes, back there. I was wondering, episodes that got cut or any parts that got cut that you would have liked to see? You know, honestly, the question was, are there things that were cut out of the show that I would have liked to see left in? Um, we're talking almost 20 years ago. Uh, I'm not going to pretend to remember uh, those things. Um, no, yo, this is funny. So when we, we, the first season, it was a very big deal for ABC, the show. And... Uh, it was going to be kind of the, the revolutionary look of their new a Saturday morning on ABC. So the network was very excited, and they had Kathleen Barr, who played Dot and I, come in to record stuff for the network kind of meeting at the, you know ABC in the States. And our characters were hosting this kind of new Saturday morning lineup for ABC. And it was really fun for me. I wish I could get a copy of it somewhere. If someone has this, let me know. Um, as Bob, I sang Conjunction Junction. <laughs> you got, does anybody know Conjunction Junction? So this was, as a kid, I loved this thing on, on, on ABC, which was called Schoolhouse Rocks. So they brought in these scripts, and they're like, you're going you're gonna to introduce that they're bringing back you know, uh, Schoolhouse Rocks. 
And I was like, this is awesome. So I got to sing, what's your function? Conjunction, junction. So that's out there somewhere animated. I, I've never seen that. I'd like to see that. Oh, and the video game was fun, too. Does anybody have the video game? It, I believe that they made it so hard to play <laughs> that you couldn't see the kind of the subsequent scenes that we did. There was a lot of like acting scenes that we did, but it was very, very difficult to play. Yes, questions over here I saw. Yes. Was there any point that you realized that Reboot became such a cult hit and had such a following? Was there any like one point that really Was there any point that I realized that Reboot had become such a cult hit? Um, trying to think, well, here we are today. This is incredible. Um, uh, 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 uh. I'm trying to think. I kind of knew, but you don't know because I'm not Kiefer Sutherland walking down the street, everyone saying, I love you in that show, right? So that I, I never experienced it firsthand. I knew. Actually, it's funny. I came back to Vancouver at one point in the 90s, and uh, there were these huge uh, posters for bus stops. And there was like a six foot bob poster at the bus stop. And I was like, this is crazy. I want, I want to copy this. Does anybody have that? Does anybody have that? I'll buy it off you. Um, it just, more and more, I would, yeah. You know what's interesting is that I think because Reboot was about the internet, that I got a lot of emails in the late 90s. People somehow got my email and people would email me, I love Bob on Reboot. And I didn't understand why or when, and now I understand. In Canada, once again, it aired so often that it was almost beating the Canadian children in submission. You will watch this show three times a day. You know? Um, so, I, I, but like I said, I wasn't really here to experience that. Oh, this is funny. This is funny. I got into law school, and I'm in Winnipeg, Canada. And I really did not plan very well ahead. And, you know, and I'm willing to make fun of myself as an adult. I was 31 years old, and I didn't plan ahead where to live. So I ended up living in a dorm with 18-year-olds from, <laughs> from small towns in Alberta and the like. So somehow, um, they, they found out I was an actor and was living in Los Angeles. And everyone on their doors, this is, I was 31. It was like a movie, it was like a comedy movie. Like, back to school, I'm 31, <laughs> living with 18-year-olds. And they put on our doors where we're from. Everyone said, you know, from, from Morden, Manitoba, from Calgary. And mine said Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> so they called me Hollywood. And they found out, this is, you're running, running me another story I can tell you. They reminded me, they found out that I did the voice of Bob. Now, I think anybody here, if you were to meet me at a, at a coffee shop or a cocktail party, and I was like, what do you do? I'm an actor. Uh, like what? I was the voice of Bob. No, you're not. <laughs> Why would I make that up? I don't know. You don't look like Bob. <laughs> so these kids were kind of skeptical, and this was the beginning of downloading. This was about 2000. So one night, I'm falling asleep on my bed, and I hear my voice echoing down the hallway <laughs> from, from Reboot. And a guy, a guy comes to me, this guy Brett, I remember Brett Medill, and he says, uh, he goes, you weren't lying. <laughs> You're Bob from Reboot. I was like, yes, I am. So this is around the same time where your other jobs that I've done, and I think you guys, animation fans, will appreciate this. Uh, I was friendly with Seth Green at the time, who was dating my friend. <laughs> and he knew that I did voices, and he says, we're going to do this show for the internet, for, for Sony, for a website called Screen Blast, called Sweet J Presents. And it's going to be kind of like a Saturday Night Live with action figures. I said, sure. He goes, you want to do it? I said, sure, whatever. I did it for free. Like, it was like for fun. We did record it in a garage. Okay? <laughs> so we did this. And then about a year later, he wanted to do it for the Cartoon Network. And they wouldn't let them use the footage they'd done for Sony. <clears throat> so they said they wanted to redo it. So he calls me up again. He goes, hey, Michael, would you like to come back and do the voices you did on Sweet J? I'm like, yeah. He goes, and I can pay you this time. I'm like, all right, sounds good. <laughs> now he goes, now what happened was, this show ended up becoming called Robot Chicken. Did everybody know Robot Chicken? Okay. So when we did the original thing, if you get the first season DVD, you, on, the, on the DVD you will see the original stuff from Sweet J. Now, I do a lot of different voices, and at the time, we were just doing this as a gas, and there was a, there was a sketch which was a, um, a spoof of um, The Karate Kid, which made The Karate Kid, which was Joey Fatone, from, mm -hmm. from uh, 
a new kids in the block, is that right? In sync. Sorry. Okay. Um, and uh, it was the, 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 the sketch was called Enter the Fat One, the tone. Get it? Enter the Fat One. So I voiced in that originally uh, Joy Fatone, <laughs> Mr. Miyagi, and some, you know, a, you know, Yakuza at one or two, something like that. So when it came time to do the show now for Cartoon Network, they got Joy Fatone, <laughs> and they got Pat Morita, Mr. Miyagi. So they said, do you want to do Yakuza number two? <laughs> and I'm like, sure. Um, the only one that they couldn't replace me on, and interestingly enough, was there was a character, I did, they did it twice, called um, Hoop Hoop Rast. Does anybody know this? <laughs> Which was a, they were a spoof of Japanese game shows. <laughs> Hoop Hoop Rass with the Japanese accent that it did. Hoop Hoop Rass! And, and this guy yelling Hoop Hoop Rass. So I remember Sethi's like, we couldn't find anybody else to do it better. <laughs> so so you're, you're doing Hoop Hoop Rass. So um, that came about, and I never in my life thought that that would be something. <laughs> never. Never. You know, I would, I would go back. I remember I was doing this cartoon in Vancouver, and at that time I started my kind of on-camera career. It started taking off. I had been on 24, on The Shield, and these different shows. And I was in a session in Vancouver. He goes, hey, man, I saw you. I was like, oh, 24, on The Shield. He goes, so you're a robot chicken, man. <laughs> and I was like, oh, right, because they put your name at the end of the episode, like single card, like, like it's a TV show. Like a, so people knew that I was doing this thing, and it was, it was a very nice kind of resurgence in my voice career. Another question? Come on, you guys. Yes, sir, in the back there. Um, is, there any, is there any project or anyone you would like to work with? Uh, the question, is there any project or anyone I'd like to work with in the future? Thank you, you're giving me anecdotes to say. Uh, <laughs> as a child, I dreamt of working with Luke Skywalker. I got to do that. <laughs> Check. Okay. Um, my childhood hero as an actor as a child was uh, Henry Winkler, The Fonz. I ended up doing a sitcom pilot with him. Check. Um, the, the next on my list is Steven Spielberg. I would like to act with Steven Spielberg in a film. Um, I was on a little roll a couple years ago. I got a little part in The Transformers 2. I worked with Michael Bay. And then I got a part in uh, the G.I. Joe live action movie. Now. If anybody here says they saw me in the movie, they're lying. <laughs> because I record, I, I was, I went to the audition and I said I did a voice on the original show, and and, uh, and she's like, really? We've got five minutes left, so we'll wrap it up. Uh, she <laughs> said, um, what character were you? I said I was a character called Scoop. She goes, I don't think he's in the movie. I said, I didn't think so either. <laughs> so they cast me in the film. They, the producers thought it was cool to have an actor who was in the voice actor of the film. And I was cast in uh, what ended up becoming uh, Destro's uh, lair and the missile command and all this thing. And I was like, you know, 10 minutes to launch and all this kind of thing. So this, this is the life of an actor, okay? I'm not a superstar. I'm not a nobody. I'm in the middle. So I do two days of filming. And a year later, they call me to do looping. You guys know what looping is? Where you fix your the dialogue on camera in the film. So I'm called into the studio, and they're having me add lines. Three, two, one, launch. You know, we're ready to go, all this stuff. And I'm watching the scene over and over again. I, I realize, I'm not in this. I'm not in the movie. So I said to the guy, I'm not even in this. He goes, oh, yeah, yes, you are. You're in another scene. I'm like, no, this is my only scene. He's like, oh, we didn't call you up to embarrass you. No, no, we like, I'm so sorry. Like, no, no, I'm like, my voice would be in the film? He goes, my name? Yes. My residuals? Yes. All of them. Okay. Okay. Right. So two days later, I get a phone call, and a guy says, uh, hi, Michael, this is Steve Summers. I'm just, I'm so sorry. I said, what? What are you talking about? Uh, this is Steven Summers. I said, oh, Steven Summers, the director. Oh, my God. He goes, listen, my own daughter was cut out of the film. And I said, I said, I, 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 I'm sorry, don't worry about it. Uh, but the irony is that I have a bigger part as a, I'm the voice of the ship in, 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 in the movie. So uh, that was me and G.I. Joe. Any other questions before five, four minutes to go here? Yeah, Any we have time questions? for one more, so yes. make it good. Come on. <laughs> Thank you. What am I doing these days, everyone asks me. Um, I still do voiceover. I do a lot of video games. Uh, in the last couple of years, I was in Uncharted 2, Uncharted 3, various characters. I'm in Assassin's Creed Revelations. I am Doreen, the son of uh, Altair. I just recorded XCOM. I just recorded End of Nations. Oh, this is fun. The job I'm doing right now 
is I am the promotional trailer voice for the Dictator movie coming out with Sacha Baron Cohen. <laughs> um, the irony is it's the in a world voice, but with a Middle Eastern accent. <laughs> so you might have seen the promos on TV, which was, in his country, he was on top of the world. But now, he must start from the bottom. <laughs> Sasha Baron Cohen, dictator, May 16th. <laughs> Uh, Jim Stu is selling books, which are the art of reboot. You should come to his, uh, his kiosk there and buy some books, and I'll sign up for you. And uh, I really want to thank you all so much, really. This has really touched me. I'm, I'm really sincere. Thank you. Stay frosty. Thank you.